Welcome to the Drum Chats Podcast, where we're talking anything and everything to do with drums. Today's topic, tuning. Here are your hosts, Travis Davis and Dave Douglas. Hey guys, welcome to the Drum Chats Podcast. This is Dave Douglas, and I'm sitting here with my buddy Travis Davis, who's down in Nashville, and today we're going to be talking about drum tuning. What's up, Travis? Not much, man. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Just, you know, living life. Living the dream. You know. Yeah, you know how that goes. <laughs> um, yeah, so we wrapped up our snare uh, series. I felt like that went pretty well. Have you had any, uh, have you seen any um, feedback from that? Heard anything? Yeah, we actually, real quick shout out. Um, there's a company called Thumb Drums and the owner's cousin. I do not remember his name for the life of me. Uh, reached mm. out and they said that they really appreciated the podcast and uh, was, just give, was just giving a shout out to um, his name was K Crest 13 on Instagram and he said his cousin owns thumb drums and he was talking about snares and really appreciated how that series went and um, had a little bit of feedback and talking about different drums and I think you and I learned a lot about snare drums too um, in the midst of talking and um, learning yeah, history sure. and players and things like that. Yeah, it's really interesting when you put yourself in a position to like uh, to be on a podcast or be talking in front of people or any sort of situation like that. It really kind of calls into question how much your thoughts are kind of arranged on any sort of subject, you know. Yeah. So it's really interesting because I feel like I have all kinds of opinions and personal experience with um, with all kinds of things with drumming. But then to, to sit down and, and really have a good conversation about it sometimes can can be a, a really different thing right. than just knowing that or having that experience. Right. Well, and I mean, the whole premise of Drum Chats, this this podcast is to dive into the the details that people don't really think about. And I think like with snare drums, especially, there are so many contributing factors to what a snare drum does and different types and options. And we, we even still, I think, barely scratch the surface with as much as we yeah. talked about, you know. And so... Um, I know for me, I learned a lot about uh, hearing from you and even some of the research we did, um, things I had no idea about snare drums or um, what you can do and how everything ties into your output and your sound. So, um, yeah, hopefully we can we can take that kind of research and uh, do another series at some point on something else. I'm sure we will. Yeah, absolutely. We, we certainly will. But today we're talking about tuning. Yes. Um, this is kind of one of those subjects that especially new drummers, but even drummers who've been playing for a long time can, uh, can definitely struggle with. Mm -hmm. Um, and I guess there's all kinds of reasons for that. Um, but I think today we just want to kind of go over what some of the typical ways to tune a drum would be. And, uh, and then we'll probably get into a little bit of our opinions of those things and what we like to do. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think maybe we go ahead and just uh, start with toms. Yeah. What do you think? I think toms I, are a great place to start. Yeah, I mentioned to you. Uh, yeah, I mentioned to you. I was sick of snares, so it's time to move <laughs> on to something else. We'll get back to snare tuning later in the episode. But right now, we want to hit some toms. Well, I think toms too are. They tend to be the difficult thing that a lot of people have trouble tuning. I mean, snares, you know, definitely because you you can get different sounds out of snares just like you can with toms. But I know for me, when I was starting to play drums. Mm -hmm. I, I had the hardest time tuning my toms and, um, you know, how to, I mean, you can go on YouTube and look up tuning tutorials and there's a thousand of them and everybody's going to say something different. But, um, yeah, I think toms are really important getting the relationship. And I think, I think that's the thing is one of the biggest importances is not only tuning the tom at the drum itself, right, but you also have to tune the relationship with your other toms correctly yeah you know for mean? sure for sure um yeah yep yeah, we've all heard about those people who tune their toms to notes or whatever right mm -hmm. yep is that something you've ever messed with uh it's funny i was talking with um with a guy yesterday about that i know dw labels their drums to a certain note yeah um, they label them they stamp them inside with what the fundamental pitch of the drum is kind of where it if you just would like tap the drum with no heads on it, you know, you, there's, there's kind of a note that you can, that you can hear. Right. Um, yeah. So they, I, I don't know. There's, I'm sure there's some sort of machine they hook it up to, or I don't know, maybe it's just a dude tapping it. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but, so, uh, but the drums definitely have a pitch mm -hmm. where they 
probably are the most comfortable or where they're always kind of wanting to land. Right. You know? Right. And I was actually talking with a guy named Jim Hanley. Jim, I know you're listening to this. Um, he, uh, he was a drum tech for journey for eight years and he's been doing cartage and teching and he's a really solid player for, you know, the past 25, 30 years. Um, and he and I were talking about this exact topic and John Good with DW, we'll just use DW as an example, is yes, every shell has a note that the raw shell has. Um, and what they do is they'll hold that shell with no holes, no bearing edge, nothing up to a mic and they'll tap it and that mic will go into a tuner and it'll tell them what pitch or what note it's ringing at. But what Jim mentioned, he said, what you've got to remember is that once you add hardware, it changes. And once you add mm. heads, that note changes. And so it's important when you're tuning your drums, even with DW, as precise as they are, is that you're tuning to the pitch of your shell with your hardware on it. Mm -hmm. um, so that note's gonna change, you know, the more stuff you add on there, it's it, it's gonna change differently. Um, <laughs> sorry, I was looking sorry. at what's going on over there. <laughs> so, sorry, there was a bug flying around. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, <laughs> But yeah, with, with tuning and so, and something that Jim also mentioned, what I thought was genius and I never really thought about was, um, so I think you and I, I know you play a five piece. You you play two floor toms at least right now with your new kit, right? Sometimes, Sometimes. yeah. I mean, it depends, but yeah, I I prefer that two floor toms. Okay, and I and I usually play with the four piece, and I want to change mine to a five with with a with an eighteen inch floor tom. But Jim, uh, in his case, he plays like two bass drums, five toms, you know, the whole journey kind of drum kit. And he was yeah. saying the best way to tune your drums is um, to tune your lowest, your biggest floor tom first and work your way up. Because with your, if you have an eight inch tom, you can always go high. But if you start with mm -hmm. your eight inch and you go down, you're 18, you, you could wind up getting flappy. So that's another, another yeah, tip to remember. That makes sense. That's interesting. I've never really thought about that um, because since I became like a serious player you know as a kid i had like a frankenstein kit that was like two drum kits put together and, you mm -hmm. know it was just something crazy that was bought out of someone's basement or whatever and that had like a lot of toms it had like whatever it had a bunch of toms but sure. um but yeah i have never actually thought about that because the most i've ever had are three toms you know the one rack and two floors and for a, a long time i just used a four-piece kit so it was just rack floor uh, so it's never really occurred to me that you, uh, it might be beneficial to start at one end right. versus the other, but that makes sense. Um, it's interesting. You mentioned it getting really flappy on the bottom end as far as, um, like floor toms and stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's something I actually love. Yeah. I always try and make my low fo floor tom like a really growl, Yeah. you know, and it's like, it's like teetering on the edge of, does that sound bad? And then you're like, no, that actually sounds really good. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I, I really like it kind of floppy a little bit down there. But I, I totally get that. You don't want to be forced into that mm -hmm. uh, if that's not the sound you're going for because it's definitely a sound. Yeah. Do you use any kind of uh, tuning tools like the drum dial or note checkers or anything? Or do you just go by ear? I use my ears and a drum key. Yep. That's what I use. That's good. Yeah, I've, I've never tuned drums to notes. Mm -hmm. I've never... Uh, found like a place that I feel like I like the drum and then take note of the tension and use like a drum dial. I've never done anything like that. I just tune the drum to where it uh, somewhere. Usually most drums have a range that they like that they can kind of operate in. Yeah. Right. Um, so you, you got to find that range. Um, and, and then, and then you can kind of play within that range a little bit. So I tend to, to like mine on the lower side. Um, but for certain projects, I'll tune them up higher. Um, and you can do that with any drum, you know, but, uh, but certainly, uh, it's interesting. The, the fact that DW does mark that what the fundamental pitch of the shell is, mm -hmm. um, I've never actually found it to be useful, but it's an interesting kind of side note that makes you remember, oh yeah, a drum actually has a specific resonance yeah a specific uh way that it's going to vibrate on its own so you can't force it too far away from what it naturally wants to do mm -hmm. um and if you do you you can it's usually pretty obvious the drum starts to sound worse and worse you know right right um so uh, yeah but you, you you know as long as you find that spot that it can kind of is comfortable in there's usually a 
a, a decent range in there you can kind of play with. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think too, a lot of people talking about all these different, um, parts of a drum, how important all of that is to even just getting your drum to tune correctly. Um, you know, a lot of the tutorial videos, you'll see the guys will talk about tuning in a star pattern or, um, you know, tune one, skip a lug or whatever. And a lot of that, you know, they may carry it or they may exaggerate on some of those things, but what that does, you know, is keep, it helps keep your hoops from warping. If you have a warped hoop, you're going to be out of tune all, all the time. And if your bearing edges are off, you're going to be out of tune. And, um, you know, what kind of hardware are you using? If you're using die cast or triple flange, um, all that goes into getting your tune, getting your drums to tune to a certain sound, depending on what pitch you're going for. But, um, mm -hmm. something that Jim was even mentioning to me, I had never heard of was compensational tuning. And he said, it's pretty, it's pretty rare. And I've never heard of it. He's like, it's, it's not very common. He said, but he, he, he was a, a, a hardcore believer in it was with some guys who hit their toms, they're pretty consistent with hitting the hoop every time. And so, the hoop? yeah, the hoop. So like on their toms. Yeah. And, it, and it's pretty common with the snare drum, you know, like, like, like we do a rim shot, but some guys People do that on toms. I know he mentioned that Dean from journey does, um, when he was teching for him, he just, he would hit the hoop every time he hit the Tom. Um, oh, that's really weird. Yeah. So what, so what it was, was that he would tune, say you had like a 12 inch Tom, um, and you had six lugs on it. He would tune four of the lugs to the note that he wants them to be at. And he would detune the two closest to Dean lower. So whenever Dean, he was hitting hard enough, the idea is that he was hitting hard enough that the hoop would actually tension the head in that area up to the same tension as the rest of them. So he would get... you got to be kidding me. Yeah, That's crazy. He would get the impact of the note and then it would immediately die. So he's already tuning with the anticipation that it's going to go up in pitch every time he hits. There's Dude, I've never heard of anyone hitting either. the rims on toms, let alone developing some sort of a tuning strategy to combat it that's really crazy i mean it it makes sense when it's when you break it down like that but it's got to be a rare thing like i mean yeah for sure i may for sure i may hit the hoop on my floor tom every once in a while but to be that consistent and that hard but you i mean you do it on purpose no no yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay no oh, okay um <laughs> I was like, that's insane. Okay. Um, yeah, that's really bizarre. Yeah, I think it's just one of those things that's like, okay, this is how he naturally plays. So we'll tune to, again, compensate for how he's playing. Well, yeah, that's pretty interesting. Um, I don't know if I have anything to add to that other than it sounds insane. <laughs> but um, yeah, I was actually thinking about that. You're talking about star pattern, mm -hmm. like, or like how to go about uh, physically on the drum, mm -hmm. um, when you're tuning. Uh, and I always do, um, like an across kind of thing, I guess it'd be the star pattern. It's just, um, you know, you skip some lugs as you go around it or whatever, but you're always kind of going to the next one all the way across and trying to always split the difference, uh, kind of crisscrossing, uh, around, around mm -hmm. the drum. But yeah, that's what I always do Yeah, for sure. Cause you can just keep the tension across all of the tension rods mm -hmm. as as equal as possible and always try to tune across you know when you when you crank up one side you obviously want to crank the other side next you don't want to do the next next tension rod right. over you know right um so yeah I'm, I'm a big fan of that for sure yeah and on snare drums on snare drums actually what i tend to do um if i if it's 10 uh 10 lug snare drum i just do every third one i just i, I tune one and then i skip two mm -hmm. tune one skip two so i kind of go around um, typically on snare drums, if it's 10 lugs, okay. um, which is not quite the same thing, but, um, it's kind of getting, getting in the same ballpark, but I always hand tension, uh, hand tighten first until everything's all the tension rods are as tight as I can make mm -hmm. them. Uh, and then I just do like half turns or maybe, well, maybe full turns to start Gotcha. until I get it up where, where I want it to go. Mm -hmm. But yeah, always kind of jumping around never just going in a circle that doesn't I don't think that works out very well yeah I I saw um well that well and, and to the idea with the star pattern like you said was that your head is seating evenly 
and that tension is being spread evenly across it. Um, the same, the same way you would change a tire on a car. Like, um, mm -hmm. you want to make sure everything's level. Um, and I saw a video and I'll put it on our website. Um, but this, uh, I forget his name, but he's, he's a really well-known drum tech. Um, he tunes with two keys simultaneously. And I, oh, okay. I, I started doing that. So he'll have two keys across from each other and he'll turn at the same time. And that way the head is not only seating properly, but it's actually both sides are moving down at the same, at the, at the same yeah. time. And I bet that's what he says. Mm -hmm. I bet that's what he says, but I, I bet you it's just, he just started doing it because he was trying to do it faster. <laughs> oh, fair point. <laughs> Get it I done mean, quicker. I, I feel like he just came up with a, with like a cool reason mm. that people would be like, whoa, he's so cool. Can you believe he thought of that? Yeah. Well, there, and, I don't know. <laughs> well, and there's a lot of different products too that I've seen coming out, like the drum dial and um, I think there's drum bot. Uh, even Evans has a, their torque drum key where mm -hmm. like you set it to a certain, ten, certain tension and it clicks at, you know, oh, at right. a certain point. Have you ever used that? Yep. Uh, yeah, but like forever ago. Yeah. Um, I've never used it in like a practical way, just more of like a, Oh, that's interesting. Sure. <laughs> you know? Sure. Uh, yeah. I have I've never, honestly, I've never used any sort of tuning helpers or, um, I don't I don't necessarily want to call them helpers like you're, you're deficient if you use them but it's a way to try and keep some sort of consistency over a period of time you know right um, or when you find the way that you like a drum mm -hmm. and you feel like you want to be able to repeat that yeah. you know some people will, will make note of the of the tension on the top and the bottom head and specific mm -hmm specific lugs you know worth what the tension is uh on them and they'll write it right on the head which is really really useful in the studio um of course a, across a, a recording session if you're using a snare even within a three minute song sometimes the 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 note the tuning of the snare will um will loosen and the note the pitch will go down and um if you're comping between takes you can really hear that if you're not paying attention yeah you know so it makes a lot of sense in the studio i feel like it's very very useful at that point but even in that context i've never done it right i think so. an, i think an important thing to remember too is there's a lot of those helpers but it's kind of like playing with a click like it's good to play with a click and it keeps you on time but if you can if your click goes out you need to be able to keep time on time on your own in the same way, if you're used to using a drum dial or a drum bot or whatever, um, and you show up to a gig and you forget that, you need to be able to tune your drums without using that. And that, and that, like you said, just kind of comes with time and using your ear. That's the only way you're going to really learn how to do that and different types too. And knowing how to get the sound that you want, um, you know, mm -hmm. like, I mean, we, we could go for hours just on tuning, drum, tuning toms, but, um, well, I think there's two main common tuning styles is straight tone and pitch bend and fall. And those hap those usually happen to be with your resonant head. Um, and so the biggest tip that I would have for toms would like, like we mentioned earlier was starting, starting with the lowest one and then working your way up. Um, so you, so you can get, even if you wanted the sound like you're talking about, even if you wanted it low and flappy, um, because that can sound really good in a mic. Um, but that way you always have headroom to go up with your other toms and making sure like if you want a straight tone that the relationship between the resonant head, um, that, that your bottom head is, is a little tighter, maybe is usually a little higher than your top head. Um, and if it's lower than your top head, it's going to kind of go boom. So Mm. I know that's where it's at. I, that's where it's at. I know you right like there. that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let's take a quick break and yeah. then we'll get back into things we like and things we don't like uh, and some specifics about uh, tuning toms. I'll uh, be right back, guys. Hey, this is Dave and it's story time. Uh, I want to tell you about a time in California that Reliant K was playing with Switchfoot at, I think it was uh, like... Uh, uh, Civic Auditorium or something. Not quite sure. Um, but we played this show there, and a lot of times during the day we have uh, some free time. You know, we'll like sound check and 
Um, you know, there's a number of bands playing, and then there's like some dead stage time and all, all that kind of thing before the show. So there's always some some free time, and um, a lot of times we're in a in a city and we can wander around and find coffee or go to a museum or whatever. Um, this show, the the promoter had a couple of bikes, and they were sitting there like all day and. You know, you keep walking by them and people be like, oh, I should go for a bike ride, I should go for a bike ride. And um, uh, Chad Butler had mentioned it to me a couple of times, like, oh, man, you want to go for a bike ride later? Yeah, of course, definitely, definitely want to go for a bike ride later. Um, and you never quite know if all your schedules are going to line up and everything else. Well, this time they did. And uh, we went ahead and went on this bike ride. Tur turns out these bikes were uh, electric bikes. They're Pedagos. If anyone's been on these, they are, uh, they're so cool. They're super, super cool. They go like 25 miles an hour. Uh, you can pedal a little bit and um, they really help you out. Or you can just like twist the handle like you're on a little motorbike or something. Um, and, uh, but they don't look much different than bikes, honestly. They, um, they just have like a battery pack and like a little electric motor or something. Like you kind of, you wouldn't even really notice it. Uh, so you can like fly by other people on bikes and they're just like, what the heck? Um, uh, but it actually kind of made me feel a little bit bad as we were blowing by other people on bikes. Um, but it was really fun. So we went for a bike ride at, um, uh, there's this area where uh, the Sundial Bridge, it's in Redding, California, as I mentioned. Um, it's a super cool bridge, um, and it's like between kind of two parks, like an arboretum and this area called Turtle Bay uh, Park of some kind. And it runs uh, along the Sacramento River. That's where the Sundial Bridge goes over. And uh, there's a really cool trail, the Sacramento River Trail. And we just rode these electric bikes, just blowing by people uh, on the Sacramento River, River Trail for, uh, you know, for a half hour, or 40 minutes or something. And then uh, cruised back to the venue and um, parked them where we found them and then uh, played a show. So sometimes every once in a while we get to do something super fun that's really casual and uh, just kind of spur of the moment when we're on the road. And that was uh, that's a good memory. And uh, I'll include a link, actually. Chad took a picture of me uh, riding over the Sundial Bridge. Uh, it's up on my Instagram, and uh, we'll include a link here. But that's it. Talk to you guys next time. Bye. Hey, everybody. We are back talking about tuning toms and probably segue into snare drums here in a little bit. But I think that toms, I like, I used to hate tuning toms. And now I like tuning toms because yeah, you mentioned that. Do you felt like when initially when it came to tuning, you had more difficulty with toms than any other drum? You said right. Yes, and I think there were some uh, not okay reasons behind that. If that makes sense, like well, this is interesting. So maybe we can maybe you maybe you want to talk about things that you felt mm -hmm. like you discovered or things you were doing wrong. Well, one thing I did discover too was. Well, some of the first heads I ever bought were uh, Remo coated ambassadors, which mm -hmm. are great heads, and a lot of people use them. But they can also they're also better for some kind of players, some kinds of players versus other kinds of players. And for me, being a rock drummer and playing hard, those being single ply, they kind of detune pretty quickly because they yeah they definitely get stretched out you can beat them up really fast mm -hmm. they, they're not super durable yeah and by I, any means yeah and i had the hardest time tuning them and and sometimes you know that goes in with the shell itself but for me i found that a two ply mm -hmm. batter head was a lot easier for me to tune because there were two plies they were thicker they were less sensitive so they were easier to get to a certain um relation in the tuning on the top head in the bottom but yeah um, it's interesting because we're starting to and and you know it's a, we keep saying this with almost every topic that it's always a multitude of factors mm -hmm. uh go into any one thing that we're talking about so it's interesting that you immediately bring up the heads because it is a big deal certainly right um and those ambassadors single ply very sensitive mm -hmm. uh they get beat up so so they require different amounts of tuning mm -hmm. even as you get into them you know they they get worn out pretty quickly and right. and when a tom head especially a tom head i think more than any other drum yeah 
a tom head when it's worn out it just start to sound bad mm -hmm. You know, you can kind of like get away with a snare head being real old. Yeah. It's way easier to get away with an old snare head than old toms. Yeah. Uh, and the same thing with kick drum. You know, a lot, of, a lot of dudes don't change a kick head until it breaks, you know, right. or like until they have a recording session or whatever, right. you know. Um, but the toms are really, really um, finicky mm -hmm. when it comes to tuning and the uh, age of the heads yeah. for sure. Well, and I think I think the reason for me too was one one way that I got over that was literally just repetition and tuning and um, mm -hmm. you know doing the star pattern and getting everything to a relative tension and then when you do fine tuning, really paying attention to what each tension rod's producing at that spot. But I think what makes the toms more, for lack of a better word or for lack of better phrasing, difficult to tune over a snare drum is that snares there's usually a lot more overtone control with snare. Even the fact that it has snare wires that already mm -hmm. changes the sound immediately. But with toms, you may want some overtone control, but you still want to hear the tom itself. You're not trying to just make it super dead. I would think. So I think that's why the toms yeah. tend to be a little bit more difficult because they're just a straight note and not having a snare sound, excuse me, a snare sound or anything like that. Yeah, for sure. There's, there's a lot more, kind of subtlety in the tuning that is often apparent in a, in a tom that it's not in other drums. The snare, you know, I, and, and when you mentioned the toms being something that was initially very difficult for you to tune as opposed to a snare, you know, it, it kind of made me uh, question that a little bit because you hit the snare drum so much. And I feel like for a, uh, for a long time, I felt like I was searching after like a snare sound and, and like a technique for how to tune a snare. Mm -hmm that I really liked. Um, and sometimes I felt like the way to get around a really well tuned snare is just to play it louder. You know, it's just right. like, Oh, if I just hit it harder, it sounds good when I hit it really hard, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but the same kind of things come into play, but, the, but there is some, definitely some transparency when it comes to Tom's. Um, can we talk super quick about, um, we, we mentioned like the straight tone and, uh, kind of a falling tone mm -hmm. in the Tom's. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering, uh, my technique when it comes to tuning is I tend to tune the top head a little bit higher than the bottom head. Okay. Um, and my initially, well, here's the thing. I always just try to get even, uh, even, uh, tone around the, the resonant head, the bottom head on, on a Tom, right? I just try to make all of it even all the way around, um, and just lightly tapping at each tension rod, trying to get them all even and here's the thing also with with tuning and this goes for with any drum when you change the tuning when you change the tension on one of those tension rods um go ahead and like you got to put your like palm like the heel of your hand in the middle of the drum and just give it a good shove mm -hmm. like you've got to put weight into the drum mm -hmm. have it laying sitting on the ground flat tune it where you think oh this seems like it's good and then just uh give it a little big like like you're uh like there's someone you're just doing cpr on mm -hmm. on the ground you know just give it a good one yeah and it changes a lot yeah right so, but that's where it's going to land when you start hitting that thing with a stick that's where it's going to end up mm -hmm. so make sure you always do that and keep doing that it's the same thing with, it's like guitar strings you know you tune it and then give a, a string a really good bend mm -hmm. because you're it's gonna it, that's what's gonna happen you when you're it playing in, yeah. it you know exactly so you definitely need to do that with drums top to bottom all, all drum heads. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, okay. So outside of that, I always like to, to make the tension even all the way around on the, on the resonant head, mm -hmm. um, find a, a pitch that I feel like is working for me. And then I tune the top head all even all the way around, just a little bit above that note. And then from there, I start to fine tune. I almost never, ever, ever end up with the tension on the top head, the batter head of a tom. Almost never is it equal all the way around. I usually have one, sometimes two tension rods that are significantly looser than the other ones. Um, and and uh, I usually find like one that seems to be responding the way I like. I'll, I'll find one, I'll loosen it a little bit. Oh, that's not really quite doing it, I'll move it back. And then I'll just kind of work around until I find one um, that's really working for me. And sometimes I end up with it like crazy loose, like not even any tension. It just depends what's happening, but I tend to find that one 
that one tension rod is what gives me the tone and helps it to dive down to that bottom note that the resonant head is. Okay. Um, it kind of it kind of uh, establishes or it kind of creates actually some uh, dampening. Actually, it can it can cause the the resonance in that head mm. to to stop. You know, oh, okay, uh, because it's not equal tension all the way around. There's something that's inhibiting the the vibrations from happening, and then and then you slowly get into the tone of of the resonant head i see um but that's that's my typical way of going about tuning uh, a tom yeah what's your such um i usually start with the resonant side first Mm -hmm. um and i i've kind of figured out for me what works as far as even and I may be wrong in doing this, but it works for me, is knowing how many turns after, I do the finger tightening thing, like you said, Um, Mm -hmm. but I do, I know how many turns of the keys where that already puts the head typically. Um, And for my toms, I try to tune them, at least the approach is always the same, you know, of course. Um, Mm -hmm. And I, for me, I figured out that there's most, tension rods are all have the same thread pitch usually there well there's two different ones yeah that you that you typically find right there's kind of like your normal one that seems pretty universal and then dw has a really fine has the uh, thread yeah the true the true pitch uh i think it's, i don't know yeah but that but what what i'm getting at was i bought those because i was like oh they're dw tension rods but then i realized the reason why they made them is because they're a finer thread yeah, so, they don't fit in all drums. Right. So if you yeah. go and if you do what I did and go to Guitar Center and buy some and you don't play a DW or a PDP kit, they're not going to fit your your tension, uh, your inserts. You'll have, you'll have to swap them out. Um, but so with a normal tension rod, which is what all of mine have, is I figured out that on all of my toms, I usually just give two full turns, um, which mm-hmm. is just 180 degrees on it, basically. Um I just 180. do. 180. Is it? Did I say full? Half turns. You said full. Half turns. Sorry. Oh, okay. Two, so one full two turn? Two half turns. So one full turn um, okay. on each tension rod. And that that already kind of puts it in the area of one, of where I want it to be. And I just figured oh, that out just yeah. over time, knowing that, that it kept, kept landing. And then from there, I'll go around the drum and I'll just, I may do some minor tweaking. Because um, I, I like, I don't like pitch, bend, and fall. Oh, um tone what's your deal <laughs> i like it okay a, i like a straight tone but i start with my bottom head i do that tuning and then and usually my bottom head's a single ply um and then on my top head i do the exact same thing and what that does is because i like a straight tone even though the heads are two different plies which does matter um uh it puts them in a relative relationship with each other. So they're vibrating the same. And in that case, I may even tune the bottom head a little higher to give it a little bit more tension. So not only does it resonate a little longer, but it may make up because the bottom head is a single ply and the top head is a double ply. But usually I try to tune them in relative range relationship together. And I do that for all my drums. So usually for me, I'll get everything finger tight and then I'll give each tension rod uh, a full turn and then just kind of go from there. Yeah. Yeah. That's usually where I get in. Yeah. I've, I've talked to a couple guys who, um, who have the bottom head, uh, higher. And I always think that's really interesting. I'm, I, I've never really messed with that too much. Um, with having the top head, like kind of floppy Mm -hmm. and the bottom head a little bit tighter, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, but that is a thing that you find as well. Honestly, with all with all this stuff, you, you really just the the best way to learn tuning is to try it. Yeah, uh, you can hear all kinds of dudes talk about what they like to do, um, but you got to get in there and actually try it a few times and get comfortable with something um, and find that the sounds that you do like. And it's actually it's pretty amazing when you start messing around with it, you start to uh, hear kind of sounds, tom sounds, snare sounds, whatever and uh it's it becomes recognizable it's almost like in the snare the snare um episodes when we were saying oh you've heard this snare before Mm -hmm. and you might not know it but then when you hear it in like a demo video or something you're just like oh yeah that drum Mm -hmm. i've heard that you know right so it's the same thing with with tuning um the same drum can sound a bunch of different ways 
and and it can come down to tuning and the heads and all kinds of things but certainly with the tuning and so you got to mess around with it and uh you'll start to find some particular sounds you like and some uh ways that those are applicable in different type of uh music situations you know yeah so you got definitely got to get in there yeah well and and a thing to remember too like you said there's different ways to get the same drum to sound differently um or there's different sounds you can make out of one drum and i've noticed that it even matters with your playing style and the genre that you're in and there's not really there, there's not one right way to tune a drum and that's something i wish i knew in the beginning because tuning was super frustrating because i thought it had to be this exact way but there's not one way to do something and mm-hmm. um you know like fusion guys they tune all their toms higher just so they can get a better bounce off their stick and a lot of yeah. rock drummers will tune them lower um so they so they can get a fatter punchier lower boomy you know, speaking Tom specifically to get that sound. And so it really, it comes down to your taste. And like you said, trying different things out, seeing what sounds good for you. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, maintaining the idea that when you're tuning your drums, there's so many different ways to do what you want. It just matters. Does it sound good to you in the end? And, and, and are you not damaging anything on your drum? It's well, there is that ideally yeah. your hoops, but it, it, right, in, right. in the the process of tuning but um yeah and a, a thing to mention i guess it probably goes without saying but um you might like a particular sound mm-hmm. of of drum or tuning and um and that's all fine and good but when you get into a session or you're playing with a uh, certain people a particular style of music like i mean work with the music it's all about the music that you're making oh yeah so you know, you got to tune your drums to work with that. Mm-hmm. Even if you, if all things being equal, you're like, oh, I prefer them to sound like this. Well, if that doesn't work with the music you're playing, then screw that. Right. Just, you know, deal with the, deal with the music thing at the thing at hand, you know? Right. Um, cause the whole reason that we're, we're playing music is because we love it. So we want to always serve the song, yeah. serve the music that mm-hmm. we're, that we're playing in. Um, yeah. So that's that. And, and remembering too, is like, say you're going into a recording session. Um, the drum we meant, like I mentioned in, I think the last episode, the tip of the day was to tune to the room that you're in, which is super important, but also remembering whenever you're recording and Dave, you know, feel, feel free to interject. Cause I know you've done a lot of recording as well with Reliant K and other projects. Um, is that not only tuning to the room that you're in, but even tuning and you hearing the drum, you directly or hearing it directly from the drum itself could and usually does sound different than when you're hearing it through the output of studio speakers. Um, whenever you're miking a tom, that's it's going to pick up everything that's happening right at the head, but your ears are your ears may hear something different, and so it's important to remember too that you know, if you're tuning in a large room and you're hearing that drum and it may not sound good. And I learned this, I was at a rehearsal space with uh, some guys I was jamming with a couple months ago was behind the drum kit. Um, it was a little small enclosed room and behind the kit when I was tuning my drums, they didn't sound good to me at all. And I asked the other guys who were standing across the room from me, I was like, how do they sound? They're like, they sound awesome. And one of the guys was like, here, get up, I'll play them for you. And I got where they were standing and it sounded way different. So it's, so even perspective is important. I remember in tuning your drums is like, you wind up spending three hours when you never needed to. And, um, what, what do you think about that? Oh yeah, for sure. I absolutely agree with that. Uh, there's been plenty of times, um, where I was working on tuning in the studio, uh, where I'm playing, uh, or vice versa, where I'm engineering or producing and, uh, there's someone else playing and we are just like, we're all trying to get to the same place. We're trying to get to a place where the toms or the drums in general are sound good, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is interesting the different uh, the different perspective from the different locations. You know, um, uh, obviously, even with like headphones or a, a, preferably the drummer using in ears, so we don't have any bleed from the click and things like that in our recording. Um, there's still bleed. You're still right now. You're in the middle of the drums, mm-hmm. you know, so you're, you're hearing the drums from that perspective. And you, like you said, the mics are not all sitting where your ears are. Right. Um, so they have a different perspective. Um, and it's interesting. Um, you, the first step is always to tune them to the room. Like you said, 
that's the place where you, that you want to start because you're also going to have overheads, which are a little bit more of an overall picture of the drum. And uh, you're more than likely going to have uh, at least a, you know, a few rim mics as well. So, um, you know, there is an overall perspective that we're hearing, but there, there's also all these close mics and they have a different perspective. So um, it's interesting. You might think that things sound okay or weird or boy, that Tom sounds like awfully strange and the engineer or whatever. It's just like, dude, that sounds so good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely interesting. You all have to trust each other. Um, and uh, the final product in that situation, of course, is what's being recorded. So that's the thing that matters. Um, but definitely start with the room, like you said, making it sound good in the room. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and take another quick break, and then we'll we'll come back and we'll talk on some kick drums. Hey, everybody, this is Travis, and I'm bringing you the tip of the day. So today's tip has to do with your bearing edges. In relation to your tuning a lot of people think that the only thing you really have to do with bearing edges is the cut and whatever cut that is like 45 45 or round over and those things are super important to the sound that your drums are gonna make but a lot of people don't think about the maintenance of your bearing edges even when you're doing something as simple as tuning your heads or even swapping out your heads so the tip is whenever you're tuning and especially whenever you're swapping out drum heads is to take a terry cloth or a microfiber cloth and just give those bearing edges a, a nice wipe down uh, and clean off a lot of the dust and wood chips and stuff that collect over time because if you try to tune your heads while those are sitting on your bearing edge your head's not going to sit evenly on the bearing edge can be sitting on that stuff so try and clean that stuff off before you tune and swap your heads out that's it. Let's get back to the show. Hey, everybody. We are back, uh, and we're going to jump into kick drum. Is that what we're going to do? I think so. Kick drum tuning? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Kick drum tuning. Um, where do we start a kick drum tuning? I start with my batter head. Um, I really do kick drum by feel a lot. I do my resonant head on my kick drum by sound and tension, um, but really a lot of it is is feel, um, and especially on the batter side. So I think I'm maybe a little bit weird when it comes to kick drums, but I like my resonant head to have a little bit of tension on it for sure and have a nice low note that it kind of is is wanting to be. Yeah. Um, uh, and I try to make that even all the way around. Um, when miking a kick drum, especially live, you end up with quite a bit of the inside sound, um, depending on the miking technique. Mm -hmm. um, but live, the resonant head typically doesn't matter quite as much, but it matters a ton, um, in, in especially in a lot of recording situations. And uh, depending on the style of music, you might only be throwing a mic on the resonant head, actually, um, depending on the, mm -hmm. the style, of course. But yeah. but so I like some tension on there, a nice low note, but it's, it's all even. Um, but my batter um, head on my kick drum, I like it so crazy loose. Yeah. It's just like, like I can... I can with one finger just push in the middle and the whole drum head wrinkles just like everywhere okay. just big wrinkles I like to be super squishy yeah um, and it's really weird for me when I sit down in a drum kit that has a lot of tension it has that like real it's like a brick wall that you're hitting with your with your kick beater yeah um, and it, if that certainly like any drum really the more tension that's on the head it it does tend to make it easier to play because there's that rebound you don't have to work as hard to get the the stick or the beater back at you into that ready position um but i i really kind of stomp on the kick drum you know mm. it's like not very good technique when it comes down to it if you're talking to like people who are like really into technique you know yeah i just totally like mash on the uh, on the kick drum and drive that beater like straight into the head you know my resting position on a kick drum is my beater against the kick drum head you yeah. know i don't hit it and release right um so i, I like it to really squish in there and push the head in a, an inch or so mm -hmm. you know so it's a little that's a little bit weird but um 
um, yeah, it's really weird for me when I sit down one that's that's hard because I actually end up with getting like bounces mm -hmm. on the kick drum, you know, yeah. if, if the if the head is is not uh, really loose. What's your situation on the uh, kick heads? Well, it, I'm kind of the same way as you, not as loose, but I want to try that. And the reason why I question um, doing it with mine, you play a 24, right? You play a 24 inch kick. Um, I have twenties. I have twenty two and twenty four. Okay, how about the 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 blue kit, the most recent one? That's a twenty four. Twenty four. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, mine's a twenty six, and um, that's crazy. Oh my gosh, I love it. That's huge. If I if I could go with a bigger kick drum, I would. <laughs> but you can. I can, and it might not be a good idea. But but with the pun, the thing that I learned too with what you're talking about, at least early on, was like you said, the tighter you tune the batter head on the kick drum um it's gonna make like a basketball kind of sound um mm -hmm. and i would watch a bunch of drum covers of these guys and not really factor in the idea that they've got eqs and they've got mics and they've got all this stuff going on um you know after the fact of them playing to make their drums sound even better but one thing that i thought of was like a lot of their drums were just really solid like, do, 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 just really punchy and deep and mm -hmm. um really short attack on them um or short release um but in my head it was like oh to get that kind of real quick that real quick thud i have to tune my drums up but it's actually yeah, the, it's the other way around it's the opposite and it's, yeah. it's doing exactly what you're talking about because with kick drums there usually is some kind of internal muffling like a pillow and you don't want your kick usually you don't want your kick drum to sound like a floor tom um yeah only in like jazz or you know there's certain situations right. of course where you want it to kind of boom <laughs> have yeah. a note and kind of ring you know right um but yeah in most situations i find myself in and, and that you find yourself in that's that's not what we're looking for right that pun that punchiness and that does matter with the size of your kick drum too is like um you know the bigger your bass drum goes the more obviously the more space that your head's gonna have and even the depth that goes into it without some kind of muffling, like with me with a 26, mine's a 26 inch diameter and 20 inches deep. If I didn't have mm. anything inside of it, it'd be pretty boomy. Um, so if I detune my batter head and put a pillow in there, it's going to be a lot more punchier than you would expect it to be because of the size of it. Um, so yeah, I'm with you on that one for sure to, to, to tune your head lower than you would expect because especially like you said with miking some guys go with just a mic in a porthole some do that and an internal mic and some do three where they even have a mic on the beater um or beside the beater to get the to to, to get that initial impact um yeah i think like I, I agree with you to get that punchiness is to actually tune lower when your instinct might be to tune higher yeah, well, we're, what typically what I'm looking for in a kick drum is is attack, but that attack has to have that low end woof to it as well. So you've got the big drum, you're tuning like the you're tuning the drum low, so you've got some low frequencies coming out of it certainly, um, and that's uh, compounded by the fact that that resonant head is still is tuned. It's a note, but it's low. Um, but really, that that attack, that real punch. Um, Man, that's just really, in my experience, comes from that having a pretty loose batter head. Um, you tend to lose that, and it becomes more of a note and less of a punch uh, when you start to tighten that thing up. You know, some people like that; they're comfortable with it, and being comfortable behind the drum kit and comfortable playing is obviously extremely important. Right. Um, so you need to be able to play first and foremost. Mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, big fan of of keeping that that batter head loose yeah. for sure. Well, you mentioned too, that it, it makes you work a little harder, which I'm all for yeah. that. Um, do you, I, I know for a while, have you always played with a double kick pedal or, or hey, yeah, I really have. Okay. Um, it kind of, I, I like almost never use it. Like in the course of a normal show, like let's say I'm playing like a Reliant K show mm -hmm. and we have an hour set. I honestly use it like four or five times in the whole show. And it's always during fills. Oh, really okay. just during That's fills. Um, I don't use it during any beats at all. Uh, it's kind of just a thing that I did when I first started playing drums. Um, 
you know, you're always trying different things out when you first start and just like every little toy you can mm-hmm. get your hands on. You're like, oh, I'll put that on the drum kit, you know? Yeah. You end up with like a ton of rototoms and octobonds and double kick pedals and just like whatever you can get your hands on, right? Yeah. So I just got really used to really used to having those two kick pedals and you know and I would play try to play beats with my two pedals and I would like I played some fills with with my two pedals and whatnot and it just became a thing that I was really cust- accustomed to really used to and I found it to be useful even if I wasn't using it in the sense that most people would use a double bass pedal so it became a thing that I just incorporated into my kit and uh, it also weirdly enough would help me uh, eventually it started helping me. I didn't really realize this at the time. It helped me set up my drum kit faster. Um, I started realizing it when we would do fly dates and I would have a single pedal there and I would go, Oh, I don't know where my hi hat goes, you know, because it, oh. it was like, I was always used to having, there's the, 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 um, you know, the connecting rod between the, the actual kick pedal mm-hmm. and then like the remote one that's mm-hmm. over on the left, right by the hi hat. Yeah. And then I just know that my hi hat goes right directly next to, next to that one. You know, yeah. it's just they're all lined up right there. Boom, boom, boom. Makes it real nice and easy. And um yeah, and when I don't have that, I feel like I set up my drum kit weird sometimes mm-hmm. and I'm playing and I'm just like, this feels really wrong. And I realize that my hi hat's kind of like it's like an inch off or something. You know, it's really minor stuff. Yeah. Um but it's funny how you just get things, you get a custom to the way your drum kit is. Right. Um, and you might not even realize it until you sit down at someone else's kit or have a rental or something like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of my safety blanket, you know, it's my safety net. Right. Um, that I'm, that I'm comfortable with. Um, certainly not necessarily. I go into recording sessions without it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I tend to like it being there. Yeah. You know, reason I, reason I ask is like with the punchiness of your kick drum, um, for me, I, I'm a single player guy, uh, to add, I did not know that you played a double kick. I saw a picture of it once or twice, but, um, before you and I met, I know I told you, I saw you at Emos, but I also saw you, I saw Reliant K on the, uh, where the light shines through tour with Switchfoot. We all yeah. played at Stubbs. And I remember, yeah. you, I remember there was some Phil, I don't remember what song it was, but you just did like. 16th or something on a double like on your kick drum i was like wait a minute i didn't know he was playing a double <laughs> kick but um, i don't i don't know but i don't know what that would be i, I can't think of any time i would do that it was well done that's all i remember but <laughs> okay. um the reason i ask is like i'm a single pedal player guy and so with the lower you tune your batter head the like you said it's going to make you work harder for me i can like i'll do double strokes on a single pedal but if there's not much rebound on that kick drum, then I may have to tension my pedal to respond a certain way. Cause I, cause I'm the same way yeah. as you. Like I, uh, I, I drive the beater into the head and it rests against the head, um, after every, after every time. But I was wondering if you did a double or a single because of how that affected you, like you said, affecting your playing, um, yeah that wasn't really the impetus of it it was just something that i already had and i didn't really realize that i could use it in a way to compensate the way that you're talking about Mm -hmm. like if i was going to do some sort of a blast beat i would i i I used to do those on the double pedal right um so i would actually use them uh during a beat you know um but yeah absolutely it makes it really tough to do doubles on a kick drum pedal when the the kick drum is tuned super low. Um, but I also, like you said, I have the tension really, really, really tight on mm-hmm. my kick drum pedal. Right. And sometimes I'll find myself just like getting frustrated because I'm just like, my, why can I not play this right now? I'm just so sloppy. Mm-hmm. I can't get this like quick, whatever happening with the, with the kick drum. And then I'll, t- I'll check my tension or I'll just like get down there and like tension it up a little bit. And I'm all of a sudden, I'm just like, Oh, okay. I can play it again. Forget it. Yeah. It was just the tension on the kick drum pedal. Right. So yeah, it's, um, it's definitely a factor. What kind of, I think you and I talked about this in the drum heads episode, but what, what heads do you use on your, on your kick drum? Usually a power stroke three. And then on the resonant? Uh, just like an ambassador. Just an ambassador. Okay. Yeah. Are you, you use a clear batter head? Um, I've used both. I've used both. I tend to like the clear better, although right now on uh, my road kit, I have a coated on it right now. Okay. Which I, I don't really like it as much. No? No. No. Okay. I don't. Yeah. I I play a coated, and, and again, that, that, that kind of goes back into an important thing to remember, and we're going to do an episode or some episodes on this, but um, 
your tuning goes like it starts with just the head but an important thing to remember too and like i said dave and i are gonna we've touched on this before and we're, we're gonna tackle it later is dampening and overtone control which also helps with your tuning so if you're having trouble like tuning your batter head and getting this weird ringing it's like you know there's other products that go into the at like that you put that you would put on after you've already tuned at least the tension and the pitch of your drum and then you can start controlling it later and we are going to do some future episodes on that unfortunately we are running out of time um and i know we didn't get to snares but like dave said i think we touched on that relatively within the last three episodes so um we will come back around to snare drums uh, at some point too but toms and kick drums i think are at least kick drums are underappreciated when it comes to tuning because there's so much punch to them you're not really looking for at least for us like we're like we're not really looking for that boomy kick drum with you know the massive floor tom kind of feel um but again just to re- just just to relay really quick uh with toms it's important to remember that you're you're like dave said you're breaking in the head um you know you tune tune it up and then put some pressure on it and break what, what it's doing is breaking the glue around the rim on that head and it's seating it and then tuning again after you do that and um, making sure that there's even tension doing the star pattern um, as to not warp your hoop and um, and then and then the the importance of the relationship between the batter and the resonant head whether you want the pitch bend and fall or a straight tone or whatever you're looking for the relationship between the two heads and also the relationship between each drum um, all matters um, what do you have to say about that Dave <laughs> I think it's true. I think it's true. Yeah, don't be afraid to break your heads in. Like, really, you can kind of abuse them. They're made to be hit. Um, yeah. I'm not suggesting that you like put uh, your uh, heads on your toms and then stand on them, but like, you can do that. But I don't. I don't do that. But really, I put a lot of weight on them. You want that. You do want that glue to uh, to break. You know. Um, and I tend to to try to like break them in a little bit before I even put them on. Like I just, I hold them up and with, you know, like I'm driving a car and I just smash my thumbs into them and spin the, spin the head around and try and break up that edge a little bit and then get them on there and start to get some tension and then, you know, try and bring it back to life, do a little CPR on it, you know, but you can really lay into it. Um, you can, you can put a lot of your weight or most of your weight on that, on the heel of your, um, of, of your hand right in the middle of that drum and you can just hold it there for you know five or ten seconds you can really try and break those things in because you want to be able to tune them and you want them to stay where you tuned them so yeah don't be afraid of uh, abusing your your heads a little bit yeah so. i think another quick thing we didn't even we didn't really touch on too is just real quick is that you're going to like some some videos will advise against wrinkling in your head um, if you come across wrinkling while, while you're tuning and usually you don't want wrinkles, um, because not, not necessarily what that's going to do to your tuning, but what it's going to do to the head, um, and the life durability of the head. But I have, and it could be a personal thing, but for me, like I have, I don't like having wrinkles in my heads. Um, you know, if it's just sitting there, I have seen guys, um, allow a little wrinkle in their floor tom or in their snare and that just helps them get to the pitch of the drum that they want but an important thing to remember is that if you are tuning with a wrinkle in your head um, it's just going to affect the head's life uh, lifespan um, but it's okay it's not the end of the world if you have a wrinkle in your yeah. head yeah it's okay i mean it's not like that's the uh, the goal is to have a wrinkle in the head but right. you know use your ears um yeah, I sometimes have a wrinkle in, in in a few drums. I've been known to do it in the snare as well. It's one of my one of my favorite things actually. I really like it. But um yeah, okay, so I think that's about it. We'll um at some point circle around and get a little bit deeper into tuning of snares, you know, at some point. Uh we definitely hit that a little bit. So I think I think we're good for right now. We'll probably sign off and uh make sure you guys hit us up on uh social media and say hey to us. And uh, if you could share this uh, this episode and some of our previous ones, that would be fantastic. Um, you can always email us, uh, davidrumchats.com, travis at drumchats.com. And uh, that's right, right? That's right. Okay. I got it. those email addresses right? You, okay, cool. You got it, man. 
And um, also, if you guys could, it would be a huge, huge help if you could give us uh, five stars and a quick review on iTunes or four stars. Try not to give us less than four stars, <laughs> you know, or don't give us a review if it's less than four. Yeah. Um, but no, really just comment uh, and review us there. That would be that would be huge as well. So cool. Um, what do we got next time? Uh, what do we have next time? Next time, I think we are doing, we're going to be hitting on awesome. We're hitting dampening and muffling systems, which will be a good follow up to the tuning. Like we were saying is like tuning always starts with the integrity of the drum and the tuning, the pitch itself. Next time we're going to be talking about how you can control some of the tones you get after you're getting your drum to the pitch you want it. Um, whether it's overtone control, muffling, uh, random DIY, put a shirt over your snare drum kind of stuff. Um, all those fun little tips and that's going to yeah, be Yeah, we'll get so. into all that. That'll be great. That'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. So with that being said, make sure you guys hit us up, leave us some feedback, reach out to us. Um, stay tuned for our next episode coming out on November 1st, flying by. Ooh. So we'll see you guys next time. See you.